Our first speaker of the day is Jeff Dean, who's our keynote speaker. Jeff has been with Google for the last few years, and uh, he's built, he's been an, an architect of pretty much every single system that we have at Google, in search, in crawling, in indexing, in advertising systems, uh, and uh, he's a Google fellow. Uh, he's also from the Seattle area. He, is, uh, uh, he did his PhD with uh, Craig Chambers, uh, and did his PhD on, on compiler optimizations for large scale, for uh, object oriented programming languages. I want to invite Jeff. Thanks. So, welcome everyone. Um, so, the plan is uh, a lot of what you see and use on a daily basis from Google is our products, um, which are, you know, Nice things, but what I'm going to talk about today is basically the underlying systems infrastructure and also a little bit about the underlying computing platform so you can understand what sort of computing systems we're building on top of, uh, just to give you a flavor of what sits beneath all these different products. Um, and so I'm not really one for mission statements, but I actually like this one because uh, it's pretty broad <laughs> and it means we'll never run out of anything of things to do. So uh, how can that be bad? Uh, so the question is, if you're trying to take all the world's information and organize it, what does that mean? So if you think about just the web, there are today tens of billions, possibly hundreds of billions of web pages in the world. You know, each one is about 10 kilobytes of data. And that gives you on the order of hundreds of terabytes of data that you need to be able to organize and search over quickly, um, things like that. And then there's all the other kinds of data that is both you know, private data for individual users, things like email, um, things uh, like uh, broadcast media, uh, now online videos, online pictures. Um, so all those kinds of things add up to an awful lot of data in the world. And it's growing substantially. And uh, most of it's in digital form these days, but some of it's not. Uh, we'd like to take stuff that's not in digital form and make, make it accessible in digital form. And the web, web search, although that's our sort of starting point as a company, is just a tiny point, tiny, tiny fraction of what we're trying to do. Uh, we, we take this pretty seriously. You know, we started with web search, and then we gradually added various other kinds of things. Uh, now we do a lot of things with geographic data. That's kind of an interesting area these days uh, with satellite imagery and uh, various kinds of pictures of cities and so on. Um, we do a lot of community-oriented applications now where we allow people to talk to other people, uh, organize their own email, search their email, and so on. Um, so there's lots of things there. Uh, and they all place different kinds of demands on the systems infrastructure. They all have slightly different requirements uh, and so on. Um, but the goal is basically to build systems infrastructure that allows you to quickly uh, and rapidly with small teams build some of these interesting products. Um, so one thing we've certainly seen over the years is that we seem to always need more computers than we have. Um, and there are several reasons for that. One is, uh, as traffic grows over time, even if you don't do anything else, you need more computational power just to handle uh, more and more requests. The second thing is, as you uh, increase the size of your index, or you index more kinds of documents, or things like that, you need more computers to deal with uh, the increasing scope of data for the same number of requests. And finally, as you try to improve the quality of your ranking algorithms, you try to apply more expensive ranking algorithms uh, on every query, you need more computational power just to perform searches over that same amount of data uh, with better algorithms. And so the product of those things means that you essentially need lots of computers, and you always seem to need more of them than you have. Um, so the goal in terms of our systems infrastructure is we want to create a uh, set of tools and systems that allow, oops, sorry, I've hit a button on the back here, that allow people to uh, make it easy to build products. And we're f heavily focused on price performance. We don't care about uh, the ultimate performance in a single machine, as I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, we want to make it easy to use lots and lots of machines uh, for people. Um, that will enable us to build better products. We can have larger indices, we can uh, update them more often, we can have more, more responsive queries, we can have faster development cycles, and so on. 
Okay. So let me talk a little bit about the hardware that underlies our computing systems these days. Uh, so the basic philosophy we have is that we uh, have chosen to build on very low cost commodity PCs. That's where you get the volumes of purchasing in the marketplace that drive costs down so that you can buy you know, insane amounts of disk storage for really cheap prices these days. You can get really fast computers that sit under your desktop for you know, not much money. Uh, and it's at that price point that you get really good uh, performance uh, per dollar. And we just build lots of them. Um, so in part, that's because we don't really care about how fast an individual machine is. You know, if you can buy the fastest machine today, it's going to cost you a significant premium to buying the one that is just a little bit slower. Uh, and we'd rather buy the one that's just a little bit slower because most of our problems don't fit on a single machine anyway. So you already have to figure out how to partition things across multiple machines. Um, and we have lots of inherent parallelism in most of our applications. So for example, there's both across request parallelism, so you're handling many requests per second from different users. Those are fairly easy to parallelize across different machines. And you also have uh, within request parallelism where you can take a large, document, large index of billions of documents and partition it into many pieces of millions of documents each. Each machine can deal with uh, a smaller index of, of you know, on the order of a million documents. And so there's parallelism both across different requests and within the same request. So it's pretty easy to figure out how to, in our case, um, parallelize computations across different machines, which means you just want lots of performance per dollar. Uh, the other thing is you could spend more on sort of more reliable machines, things, you know, higher end servers tend to have features like uh, rated disks, uh, redundant power supplies, things like that, which are very nice features to have. But you pay a lot of money for those features. Um, and at our scale, even machines that are ultra reliable that have these, thing, these features are going to fail anyway. So you already have to deal with this in software in some form. It's just a matter of how often do you have to deal with it. And if I can buy twice as many machines uh, versus buying uh, you know, the same number of uh, half the number of reliable machines, I'd much rather have twice as many machines because they're not you know, half the reliability. OK, some gratuitous pictures. Uh, <laughs> this is when, I, when Larry and Sergey started the company, uh, started the project that it was a research project at Stanford. And their, their advisors apparently wouldn't buy them any computers. So uh, what they would do is they'd go down to the loading dock at Stanford and volunteer to receive shipments that other research groups had ordered uh, of machines other research groups had ordered and uh, volunteer to set them up. And then they would kind of live on the float. They'd kind of hold on to it for a little longer and use it. Um, uh, a drawback with that is I think they had like 10 computers and nine different processor types and operating systems in here, which is a little more heterogeneous than you might like. Um, but clearly, their lessons have played out well in designing the first versions of our machines. <laughs> um, so when we were first starting out, we needed machines quickly. And we decided that we would manufacture our own machines because it was too expensive to buy other ones. Uh, so we would buy mo motherboards and, and disk drives and kind of assemble the parts. Uh, each one of these trays has uh, four motherboards, so four machines, basically, uh, and eight disks. Each machine had two disks. There's four in the front kind of laid on top of the motherboard and some wires to kind of uh, keep, the, keep them off the motherboards. And then there's a row of four that are more neatly organized in the back. There's reset switches in the front. Um, and they're all sitting on this tray. And to protect the tray from the motherboard, the motherboards from the tray, there's a thin layer of cork. Uh, below the motherboard. Uh, so these were affectionately known as cork boards. Um, they also had some cabling issues, which kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so our next design, we, we decided we would emit the cork. And we might be better served by putting all the connectors on the front of the machine rather than snake it back to the back. Um, so this was uh, around 2000. Um, data centers were. Uh, interesting in those days. They, uh, lots of people would buy kind of high-end sun machines and put them in, in cages in data centers. Uh, and data centers charged by the square foot, which was an interesting pricing model. Uh, so our incentives, as far as we could tell from reading the contract, were to pack as many machines as we possibly could in those square feet. Um, and uh, they didn't actually charge you for power, which was kind of nice. <laughs> um, 
So we sometimes had to help them out a little bit on their uh, cooling. So we bought a little fan at Target. <laughs> um, uh, eventually, uh, uh, another skill we had to acquire was moving out of bankrupt data centers and into new ones. <laughs> uh, because the pricing model seems to have not worked for a lot of those data centers. Um, so you know you get pretty good at building uh, pretty large scale clusters and de deploying them rapidly. Basically, you can pre-wire all these things on a rack level. The racks are on wheels. You just kind of wheel them in, and then you have to cook, hook up the inner rack uh, networking, and away you go. Um, this is kind of our current generation. Is you know looks pretty similar. It's basically commodity PCs, uh, usually with uh, dual. Uh, uh, CPU chips with now two cores per, per chip, so typically four processors per machine. Um, it's got low-end, you know, uh, hard drives. Um, they run a version of Linux with a very tiny number of patches we found useful for our particular platform, and then a bunch of custom in-house software. Uh, and that's kind of one, one thing to point out is typically our networks have, you know, uh, we have a cluster of perhaps um, thousands or tens of thousands of machines connected together with a central switch. And we have a bunch of machines in a rack that you share a switch for that rack. And then that, switch, that rack switch hooks up to a central switch for the cluster. And there's less bandwidth available than, you would, than full bisection bandwidth for all the machines. So one bottleneck in our system is, um, Talking outside of a rack is less efficient than talking inside a rack. So we do a bunch of software things to kind of help mitigate that in some ways. Uh, just to give you a flavor of the kinds of things that can happen in a cluster, uh, I asked one of our ops people to put together this list of uh, what kinds of things actually happen. This is, this is in the first year of a new cluster. After that, they get a little bit more reliable than this. But um, you know, this just gives you a flavor of uh, some bad things that can happen. And some of these are, you know, you'll lose 40 machines for a few minutes. Some of these are, you might lose several thousand machines for, you know, a while. Uh, you have lots of individual machine failures. Um, many more hard drive failures than that. Uh, so that's, that's the delightful platform we build on. <laughs> um, OK. so. What I'm going to talk about mostly in this talk is three pieces of infrastructure we've built over the past few years to uh, sort of allow us to use that computing platform in a sort of reliable and reasonably efficient way. The first thing is um, if you have a bunch of computers with disks, you'd probably like to be able to store stuff on them. And you'd like a sort of distributed file system so that you can have a you know, centralized uh, common namespace over all this data. So, one thing we decided early on was uh, our file system requirements were a little bit different than typical file system uh, uh, objectives. Uh, in particular, we want to have really large read and write bandwidth. We want thousands of clients to be able to talk to thousands of machines in a file system and get really good uh, I.O. bandwidth for reads and writes. Uh, it needs to be reliable in, so at sort of the cluster level of machines. Um, we're mostly dealing with fairly large files. Most of our systems kind of take you know, small things like web pages and put a bunch of them in a file. So we have, you know, files that are many gigabytes typically rather than lots and lots of tiny little files. Um, and we need sort of efficient distributed operation, which means we don't want to have a central bottleneck in the file system as much as we can help it. Uh, one thing that really helps us is we basically control, we're, we're able to link in sort of some client side code into our file system to uh, put some of the logic of how to deal with this distributed nature of the file system into our client applications rather than having to have it work at OS level or have everything proxied through a server that we control. OK, so the basic idea of GFS is we have uh, a special machine called a master that deals with all the metadata, the file names, and keeping track of a mapping from file names to chunk locations. We break. At the master level, we break files into 64 megabyte chunks, which is a pretty large block size by file system standards. Uh, the actual chunks on disk use Linux files, so those are stored with 8K file system blocks or whatever it is. Um, but at the master level, it keeps track of things at the 64 megabyte level. Um, 
And then the individual, the actual data for files is stored spread across a bunch of uh, what we call chunk server processes uh, stored on local disks on the machines. And every chunk is typically replicated three times uh, on three different machines. And typically, we try to spread out the chunks across different racks so that if you lose a rack, you don't lose all three copies of your uh, uh, of a particular chunk. Um, so the master manages metadata. Clients talk to the master when they open a file. Mas the master says, yes, the file exists. And here are the, the three replicas for the six different chunks in the file. Um, gives you 18 machine locations, and away you go. And then the clients talk directly to chunk servers to uh, read and write files. And occasionally, they'll talk to a chunk server, and the chunk server will say, I don't have that chunk anymore. Go talk to the master again. Uh, and the master is also responsible for when noticing when a machine dies and then re-replicating any chunks that that machine had to make sure that they're bringing them back up to the full uh, desired level of replication. Um, so that system's been uh, pretty stable for a while and, and is sort of running on almost all of our machines uh, in various uh, clusters. Uh, we have probably several hundred GFS clusters some of them have you know, upwards of 5,000 machines. Um, you often get pretty large collections of clients talking to the file system, and you get pretty high bandwidth rates out of these file systems. As you're processing a large amount of data, you have maybe 10,000 clients talking to the chunk servers in that file system. Um, and it all sort of works in the presence of disks failing and, and machines going down and racks going down and so on. <coughs> OK, so now that we are able to store data, uh, it's often useful to be able to compute over it. Um, and in the early days of Google, we would basically have some large data set, maybe a bunch of documents we'd crawled. And then we would um, need to write some phase that, say, uh, counted how often every word occurs. And so we would take the files, and we would sort of write some hand partitioning code write some code to partition the problem into you know, a bunch of chunks of those files. And we would write some code to actually do the work of counting word frequencies, which is you know, that much code. And then we would have a bunch of code in there to deal with checkpointing the state of these, this computation and what happens when a machine fails, uh, how do you recover. And so all the messy details of running computations on this sort of slightly unreliable computing hardware uh, sort of obscured the real computations we're trying to do, which were often fairly simple things like count how often words occur or cluster documents by uh, content checksum or something like that. Um, so MapReduce is a system we came up with after writing several of these phases that sort of abstracts away a lot of the messy details, allows you to express your computation in this uh, particular programming style. And then the library can deal with what happens when machines fail and so on. OK. Uh, I've probably said most of this. So the basic idea is um, you're going to have some input data, which is uh, you can think of as a set of key value pairs or input records of some, some form. Uh, and the crawl, if crawled pages example, the key is the URL of the page, and the, con the value might be the contents of the page. Um, so the map phase, you're going to process those input records and produce uh, some sort of intermediate uh, key value pairs that you're uh, computation is trying to extract from that input data or summarize from that input data or whatever. Um, and then uh, there's a reduce phase where you can specify for the same intermediate key, how do you want to combine different values that may have occurred from different records or multiple values from the same record? How do you want to combine them into your final output data? Uh, so the user basically writes these two simple functions, map and reduce. And the underlying library then takes care of it. And the user provides a little specification of what input data they're supposed to be processing and so on. Um, so let's look at an example. Here, the key and value are uh, a URL and the contents. And then the map function, since we're trying to count word frequencies, is just going to, for every word in that text, we're going to like split it at spaces and emit key value pairs that are each word occurrence and one. Uh, simple enough. The reduce computation, or function in this case, will be very simple. It's basically going to get invoked for each unique word and for each unique intermediate key. 
word in this case. Uh, and then it's going to get the sequence of values that the map function generated for those things. Uh, in this case, it's just going to have the values one uh, many times, one for each word occurrence. Uh, and it's going to add up all those things and emit a final count, a final table, final count for that word. And then the library takes care of applying the reduce function to every unique intermediate key, and away you go. Um, now, this is a really simple example, but you can do uh, much more interesting things with it, uh, like produce inverted indices. You can um, you know, do training for machine learning systems. Uh, various things, it turns out that you can f express a fairly wide variety of problems in this map and reduce style. Um, so some of the things the library does for you are, uh, it makes your computation pretty fast. One of the things it does is um, it tries to put computation for particular chunks of your data onto the machines that have that data or push it close to those machines. So remember I said we have limited sort of cross rack bandwidth. So it will actually push computation to close to where the data is, because the computation is typically you know, the size of a binary, and the, uh, the data is typically much, much larger. Um, and so you can often get you know, thousands of machines reading their data uh, conceptually off of the distributed file system, but really it's just reading off the local chunk server in most cases. Um, uh, you can spend a lot of effort on the sorting algorithms and the sorting library inside MapReduce, because um, you know, you can tune that a lot, and then everyone who uses this library benefits. Uh, the system deals with machine failures. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, can deal with bad records, like if you uh, are using some third-party library that crashes on, you know, some random record in some deterministic way, you can effectively set it up to, uh, after it's tried that a few times, it can skip that record, so your computation will actually complete, uh, if that's what you want. Um, or you can say that's, I, don't want to skip records. That can, you have your choice. Uh, it's pretty easy to use. It deals with ha what happens when you want your computation to go faster. You can just add more machines generally, um, and it'll run things with wider degrees of parallelism. Um, and it also gives you some monitoring and sort of central status pages that you can look at as your computation is progressing. That's kind of a standard for across all these different kinds of jobs we're trying to write. Um, so it's being used kind of basically all over Google. I have a graph later about how many different MapReduce programs there are. Um, but it's, it's basically an, uh, a batch-oriented computational model that's bit proved pretty useful. Uh, so there's some testament to this. If you look at the number of different MapReduce programs in Google Source Tree over time, uh, those early numbers are when we were basically trying to rewrite our production indexing system, which had a sequence of maybe eight or 10 different phases uh, uh, to you know, take raw documents on disk and ultimately end up with a, um, a final uh, inverted index and other data structures for serving. And uh, so that was when we first started using MapReduce. We didn't think it would actually be useful for things other than our indexing system. But people found out it's actually pretty easy to use and it would take care of a lot of problems they were uh, finding in you know, writing other kinds of computations. Uh, if you take the derivative of that graph, um, this is the number of new MapReduce programs per month, as some testament to it actually being easy to use. Uh, every summer we have a bunch of summer interns come in. <laughs> and uh, most of them don't have any experience with writing distributed computations or parallel computations, but uh, they seem to be able to check in map reductions into our source tree. I don't know if they work, but they, <laughs> they do get checked in. Um, and they, seem to run a lot of jobs. So uh, here's just some stats about it, how much it's being used these days. Uh, you know, the typical MapReduce finishes in 10 to 15 minutes, uh, but it uses, um, you know, several hundred machines. Uh, that's just kind of, you know, we run 3,000 of these computations per day. Uh, we have a bunch of deaths per job. That's fine. Most of those are caused by some job that repeatedly crashes over and over. Not so much that every job has five worker deaths. Someone also pointed out that worker deaths seems bad when Google is hiring so fast. So I assure you, these are all, <laughs> these are all machines. <laughs> um, so a little bit of how the computation is actually uh, staged. The, basically, the map produce 
program has two kinds of workers. There's a master who's responsible for sort of coordinating the activity, dealing with what happens when machines fail, knowing which other workers have done which pieces of work, uh, which tasks. Um, so it basically knows the input data that's provided by the user and uh, breaks it into a bunch of tasks. Those tasks are then parceled out to free workers. So it says, oh, I have a free worker. I'll tell it to do map task 12. Uh, and typically, you want to have many more map tasks than you have worker machines because that allows you two things. One is uh, better load balancing. If one map task turns out to be slow, then the other machines just do a little bit more work and the slow guy kind of turns away for a little bit longer on one of the map tasks. It also makes recovery a lot faster. So if you have each worker doing 100 tasks and one worker dies, then 100 other machines can each pick up one piece of work and recover very quickly from uh, that machine dying. Uh, the other thing we allow the user to do is to partition the intermediate keys, typically with a very simple function to like fingerprint the keys and, and do the mod n, uh, so that you can apply the reduce function in parallel. So you end up spreading the, the intermediate keys and computation of reduce over a bunch of machines. And then you end up having to do the shuffle, so the master keeps track of which reduce workers have to talk to which map workers for, to get intermediate data from uh, those machines. The intermediate data is written to local disk on the map workers and basically buffered there. Um, then it's transferred across the network just by doing RPCs. Um, and then we shuffle it once we have all the data from all the map workers. because We can't sort of apply the reduce function uh, until we have finished all the map tasks because the guarantee we make for uh, the client is that uh, we're, when you process an intermediate key, you're going to see all the values for that intermediate key. Um, and so that's uh, basically how it works. And then we, once we have all the data and we've sorted it, grouped it together, which we do by sorting, then you apply the user's reduce function to each unique key, and away you go. Uh, so the status pages I alluded to, beautiful pieces of red and green. Uh, so uh, the the green indicates map tasks that are currently in progress. This is sort of when a job is just starting up. You see in the upper left, we have 323 workers. No deaths so far. Hurrah. Uh, we've split things into 13,000-ish map tasks. Those are called shards. Uh, we've started working on 323 of them. Our total input is a little bit shy of a terabyte. Um, we've done about a gigabyte so far. Uh, and we've decided to partition the reduce function across 500 different machines. We have 500 reduce partitions in this case. Uh, this is actually some phase of our indexing uh, pipeline. Um, so as map tasks complete, uh, we start shuffling the intermediate data from the completed map tasks as those same workers are uh, doing it, other map tasks that are in progress. So you basically pipeline the shuffling of the data with the computation of the map tasks. Um, and now you see we have more workers. We have 1,707 workers. We've had a death, but it doesn't really matter. Fine. Uh, and eventually we get up to 100% map task complete. All the shuffling is now done. The red is the shuffling. And now we're starting to apply the user reduce function, which is the blue. And uh, you know that proceeds in parallel across the 500 machines we've asked for for our reduce partitioning. Um, and we get close to the end, and now we have all but two of them are done, all but one of them is done, and finally, they're all done. One thing you notice is that stragglers are kind of a problem. Sometimes you end up with a slow machine that uh, isn't due to data dependence in the actual uh, work it's doing. It's just slow for some other reason. It could be you know, lots of other jobs are running on that machine, so it's, you're getting less of the CPU. It could be maybe it has a bad local disk, and so instead of reading at 20 megabits a second, it's reading at one megabyte a second because the disk controller keeps retrying things. Um, there's all kinds of reasons. We've actually had uh, uh, all kinds of weird things. Um, in one of our first platforms that used hyper-threaded processors, the BIOS manufacturer hadn't really thought about what would happen when two chips were reading and writing processor registers and at the same time. And so they had a race condition where it would read processor status register, diddle some bits, and then write it back in. And you'd end up with, uh, in 4% of the time the machine rebooted, you'd end up with the processor caches disabled because it would stomp the bit that says, please enable the processor caches. So 
that was kind of annoying because you'd reboot the machine and you reboot 100 machines and four of them would come up slow. You reboot them again, four other ones would come up slow. <laughs> and a, a machine without caches is a working machine, but it's like 30 times as slow. It's very annoying. Do you mix, do you mix the jobs? Do you run one job to completion or do you overlap the jobs so stragglers are filling in the front of the next one? Um, so if you have a dependent MapReduce, we typically would run that one to completion and then run the next one. But we are interleaving lots of independent computations like on the same cluster. So there might be you know, hundreds of users running different MapReduces on the same cluster, um, you know, random jobs, uh, taking network bandwidth, taking CPU from you. So uh, it's pretty important to deal with stragglers. Um, so I mentioned some of these locality, the shuffle stage gets pipeline. Um, one thing we do to deal with stragglers is towards the end of the computation, we will start off multiple copies of the last few map tasks or the last few reduced tasks, and um, whichever one finishes first wins. That actually brings in the job completion time tremendously because um, you'll typically get scheduled on a machine that's, that's, fast, that's not as loaded as the, the slow guy, and it will be able to complete things more, more quickly. Uh, we also compress intermediate data because our environment is more CPU rich than network rich, so it makes sense to, for us to do fairly lightweight compression on the intermediate data just to avoid the interact uh, transfers. Um, so it's proven to be pretty useful, uh, and we have a paper about it that has a lot more details about it if you're interested. You just search for MapReduce, you'll be able to find it. Uh, okay. The third half of the talk. Um, so uh, over time, we found that a lot of applications wanted a interface to storage that was a little bit higher level than just a raw file system. They wanted to be able to process lots of different kinds of uh, structured, semi-structured data where you had maybe different pieces of data would become available at different times, but they all were kind of related by some, some key. Uh, in our crawling system, for example, you have URLs as kind of the natural key to tie everything together. And then you have um, various kinds of data, like uh, you might have some small metadata saying, when did I last crawl this URL? Or you might have other things like uh, the actual contents of the page, um, the last time you crawled it, or the last few times you crawled it. Uh, and then you have other things that are being run kind of asynchronously, where you're extracting links from these pages uh, maybe you're running a page rank computation over the graph structure you've extracted from all these pages and you want to update the page rank value for this page. So these are all kind of tied together with the, uh, the URL. Um, and we have other systems that have kind of natural uh, keys for uh, organizing data where you have, uh, for example, per user data, you have user preferences, you, have, you want to be able to keep track of recent queries done by this user so you can show them in their search history that kind of thing. And geographic data tends to have a natural organizational point where you want to organize around uh, you know, a particular region of the Earth, Earth's surface, and you have satellite imagery, you have vector map data, you have maybe user annotations that you've allowed users to make about different points of the Earth, and so on. Um, so we really need something that looks kind of like a database, uh, but we needed to scale to really large amounts of data. You know, we have, you know, hundreds of terabytes of raw web content. We have you know, lots of satellite imagery data uh, and so on. Um, so we want something that uh, has this structured or semi-structured API uh, and it's kind of like a database. Um, so you could use a database uh, like Oracle or something. Um, the problem is the scale is really large. Uh, even if you could buy something, it would be really expensive and it would solve the problem for that particular application. And then we have lots of applications that are like this. Uh, so the next time you wanted to solve, not for URLs, but for satellite imagery, you then have to go uh, spend a lot more money. Um, uh, also, we can kind of integrate it with our file system and uh, have a little bit tighter integration of how the system deals with you know, compressing data, how it stores data on disk, um, and get uh, some nice advantages from that. So we basically decided to build something like this ourselves. We decided we didn't really need full database functionality. So we don't support joins. We don't support full SQL queries or something. We have a fairly simple API that allows you to get at uh, data with the following model. Um, it's basically a multi-level map that I'll describe in a minute. Uh, it's designed to be fault tolerant and persistent. So once you've written data into the system, it basically is persistent. Uh, 
It's scalable, so we have systems with several thousand servers serving a set of tables in a particular, uh, what we call a big table cell. Um, the, it's pretty, and a lot of those cells support pretty high volumes of reads and writes. We initially did it more for batch style uh, things like our crawling system, but more recently it's been used a lot in user facing applications where latency is a much bigger concern, where you want this operation to finish in 10 milliseconds and, and you need that to happen. Uh, it's important to us that it be self managing so you can um, you know, it deals with machine failures, of course, but also you want to be able to add another 500 machines to the cell and then have it take advantage of the extra capacity that those machines should offer. Um, and sort of load balance across the available machines that it does have. Um, so the basic data model is that you have rows and columns. Think of it as kind of a really big spreadsheet. Uh, and uh, a lot of our applications actually wanted to be able to look at multiple values uh, across time. So in our crawling system, it's useful to be able to keep several versions of crawled content so you can look at how much is this page changing uh, you know, from one day to the next. Is this something that's completely static? Is it changing only a little bit? Is it changing a lot? Um, so we actually allow a third dimension of time where you can set up a particular column to keep you know, all versions of data that you've written in there. Uh, one version, you can say, I want to keep all the versions in the last two weeks, that kind of thing. Um, and it turns out, you know, if you squint at this uh, abstraction right, a lot of our applications can make use of this thing because it's a pretty generic um, abstraction. Um, so the way we actually take this and distribute it across lots of machines is you can think of the table as a sorted uh, sequence of rows. Uh, we actually think it's important that the uh, users be able to get at sorted uh, sequences of rows rather than just a random ordering like a distributed hash table or something. Um, so we break these tablets, these tables into what we call tablets, which are just contiguous regions of rows that are roughly a few hundred megabytes in size. Uh, and we have a um, serving machine that's going to be responsible for on the order of 100 tablets, you know, for the same reasons that we want a map worker to deal with, you know, many uh, different uh, map tasks, uh, it helps recovery. So if one machine fails, you can quickly have each of 100 other machines pick up responsibility for one tablet, one of those 100 tablets, and you recover pretty quickly when a machine fails. It also gives you finer granularity load balancing. So if you notice a machine is overloaded, you can move one tablet at a time away from it until the load imbalance kind of uh, goes away. So initially, we have tablets. We have two tablets in this table at the moment. Uh, eventually that bottom tablet gets enough data that we decide to split it. And so we basically pick a row that's roughly in the middle of the two uh, of the tablet. It seems to split the, the amount of data in roughly in half. And then we partition that into two separate tablets that are now independent. And we can move one of them away from this machine, uh, put it on some other machine, um, and so on. We actually also do merges, which are more complicated because you have to sort of stage things a little bit. In the case of a split, the thing you're trying to split is one tablet and that's on one machine. In the case of a merge, those two things are independent entities and you have to sort of pre-stage things to get the tablet on the same machine before you can kind of uh, glom them together. Okay, the system structure we have, like a lot of our systems, we have a master that is responsible for basically metadata operations and load balancing. We have tablet servers that uh, serve data. And then on beneath that, we build on top of a lot of the other infrastructure, uh, some of which I've talked about, GFS. Uh, we have a cluster scheduling system where you can insert jobs into the cluster. And you say, I want to run uh, 100 tasks on different machines for my job. And it will take care of allocating resources to you. It takes care of um, handling failover. When a machine fails, it will restart that task on a different machine. Um, GFS, obviously, we store the uh, underlying state for the table in uh, GFS. And we have a distributed block service so that that's highly available and reliable so that, uh, for example, the master wants to, we want to have hot f spares for the master. So if the master goes down, we bring another one up very quickly. So we actually just start two processes. They each try to grab a distributed block in this lock service to say, I'm the master. One of them will get it. 
and then the other one will basically continuously try to acquire that lock. So if the first master fails, then the other one sort of takes over fairly quickly as soon as it can grab the lock. Uh, and then we have a client library. Again, we can link that into applications. And uh, the client library, when it needs to open a table, uh, the, the metadata for each table is stored in the lock service. Um, and then it talks directly to the tablet service to read and write data. Uh, occasionally, it talks to the master. But unlike GFS, most of the metadata uh, operations, uh, most of the location information to find out where a particular piece of data is is actually handled by the tablet servers and spread out over all the tablet servers. Um, so you only need to talk to the master if you want to create a new table or something like that, which is pretty rare. Um, so the state in our tablet is basically we uh, have a, a mutation log of mutations that have been added to this tablet. So when a write comes in, we append to that log. Then we buffer that write in memory uh, so that we have um, efficient access to it. Um, when a read comes in, we look in our in-memory buffer. And we also maybe look in some uh, compacted representations of the uh, log that we've stored on disk that are organized, sorted by key. Uh, sometimes you need to look in multiple of those. Uh, you can also specify that some columns are mapped in memory. So you might have a bunch of files mapped in memory to represent things. Um, so as I said, a compaction happens when there are two kinds of compactions. One is you buffered up a bunch of updates in memory, and now your memory is getting full. So you're going to take that state in memory for this tablet, write it out into a uh, on-disk immutable form, and then um, you can flush your memory and serve the state off of those disk files instead of off of memory. Uh, the other thing is eventually you build up too many of these files, and you need to reduce the number of files. And so you basically pick a bunch of them, you merge them all together, and then you produce one file for the tablet that represents the state up to a certain point in the log. So you always have the state of the last major compaction, and then you have some number of, of other files that are minor compactions, and then you have the piece of the log that has not yet been compacted. And that's kind of the state of the tablet. Uh, we also allow the ability to segregate columns from other columns in the on-disk representation under user control. So one thing that's very useful is if you have uh, some columns that are very small and you want to iterate over them independently of all the other ones, the contents here is quite large. It's basically all the contents of all the web pages we've crawled. And sometimes you might want to iterate just over the page rank and lang language uh, values for the page, which are you know, a few bytes each. So we allow segregation of uh, columns into what we call locality groups. And you can say, this one should go in this locality group. This one should go in this locality group. And then if you need to scan and you only scan the language and page rank columns, your I.O. is proportional to the data in those columns rather than all the columns. Um, so one tricky thing in the system is how do you actually locate a particular piece of data? So uh, what we actually do is we store tables that are themselves big table tables. And those tables point to the tablets and the other tables. Uh, in the other machines. So um, there's a bootstrapping table that we store in our lock service, which is a pointer to the meta zero table. That meta zero table has one row for every tablet in the meta one table. Every row in the meta one ta table points to the actual location of a tablet of a tablet in a real user table. So if I need to find ro a row in this user table on the right, I go to the meta one table and scan forward to find the right row for that tablet, for that, uh, find the entry in the meta one table, which will point me at that thing. If I don't actually have, uh, know where that tablet is, then I go back to the meta zero table and find out where that meta one tablet is. And if I don't have the meta zero location, then I read that out of the bootstrapping table. Um, it seems to work pretty well. And if you apply a little bit of um, sort of prefetching and caching, then you generally just need to go directly to the machine on the right, and sometimes need to do a lookup in the meta one table. Most of the other stuff is cached completely. Um, so we now have you know, about 500 of these cells, uh, where a cell is a master and a bunch of tablet servers. Um, the biggest one is managing you know, three, terabytes of, uh, three petabytes of data. 
and um, it's in actually active use for a lot of projects. Most projects these days are building on top of something like Bigtable or Evan building directly on raw JFS files. So in terms of what I think our, our challenges are in terms of where we want to take our infrastructure these days, um, I think a lot of these tools work pretty well at the single cluster level. Uh, we're pretty happy with those. Where we have issues is um, in terms of we have lots and lots of clusters distributed around the world, and we don't really have a single system that deals with data in all those clusters or computation in all those clusters. Um, so one thing that would be really nice is to have a single global namespace for all of our data. Right now, we have different GFS cells, and those are separate namespaces. So if you copy files from one GFS cell to another, there's no automatic system that knows that, that connection of this data it was originally copied from this data, and it's another source if you need to read it. Um, so we really need uh, some way of keeping track of that kind of thing so that you can more automatically uh, make more replicas of data across different clusters, for example. Uh, and we'd like to more, in a more automated fashion, migrate data and computation across clusters. We sort of do that migration today within a cluster, but not very effectively across clusters. Um, once you have that, you have lots of consistency issues that are mostly tied into wide area replication and network partitions of this cluster is now offline for a few hours for maintenance or something. Uh, or it's partitioned, but I'm still getting requests in both sides of the partition. I need, in a lot of cases, I need to be able to do something reasonable, continue operating in some limited mode on both sides of that partition. I can't reasonably say to all the user requests that show up in the, the non-quorum side of the partition that, well, sorry, you can't do anything. It'd be better to show, for example, you show users their email, uh, but maybe um, say some update, some email messages may not have shown up or something rather than completely not showing them anything. Uh, so basically, looking at how can we build systems that are spanning multiple clusters and are a much larger scale than what we've built today. I will briefly talk about uh, the kinds of, so a lot of what I've talked about is the stuff that sits underneath, but the end goal is to build uh, interesting products, uh, interesting features of products. So I'll talk a little bit about the kinds of things you can do given this infrastructure. Um, it's actually a pretty nice environment because we have built this infrastructure and it's pretty easy to write you know, a random MapReduce. Interns have a lot of fun writing MapReduces and doing interesting computations. Um, and we have a lot of interesting data. So you know, one of the things I think we believe pretty strongly in is that the more data you have, the better you can make your systems. Uh, this is actually an example of uh, all the various uh, the top one is the correct spelling of Britney Spears. All the other ones are misspellings of Britney Spears um, that uh, were detected by our spelling correction system to be misspellings and corrected to the correct spelling. Um, and you see there's a very long tail of, of, of potential misspellings. <laughs> um, and the more data you have, our spelling correction system is trained on a, a collection of, of documents and queries. And the more data you have, the better the system is going to work, because you're going to see more examples of, of misspellings and corrected uh, things that have been corrected to and so on. Uh, actually, there's one here that's briny spears that may refer to pickles. <laughs> I'm, I'm not certain. That may be a problem. Um, the other thing you can do is you know, put together little demos of interesting things. So this is looking at query frequency. It's a little bit old. Uh, data taken from an old system. So this is beginning of 2002 to the middle of 2003. So it spans 18 months. The frequency of queries uh, for a variety of, of cases of, of queries to Google.com. So you see, for example, the Eclipse case, there's always some number of queries containing Eclipse because Mitsubishi makes a car called the Eclipse. Um, but occasionally you see a big blip in, in Eclipse queries. And actually, if you look at the frequency of individual queries in that, those days, you can figure out if it's a lunar or solar eclipse, which is kind of cool. Um, the, every 28 days, regular as clockwork, we seem to get a big spike in queries for full moon, which is kind of cool. You wouldn't have expected that, but there it is. Uh, you may not have expected watermelon to exhibit seasonal trends, but <laughs> it does. Um, it's kind of low in the winter, you know, 
Uh, there's a big spike in the middle of summer. Anyone, any guesses? Fourth of July, right? It's a popular picnic uh, food. You're trying to figure out what to do with all this watermelon you've gotten. I don't know if it's actually the fourth or the fifth of July. <laughs> it's probably the fourth. Um, World Series, you kind of expect a big spike in October for the Baseball World Series, but there's actually two other World Series that happen, the Little League World Series and the College World Series. Um, so I think, you know, this is kind of a toy and it's kind of fun to play with. Uh, there's actually a public version of this called trends.google.com that you can do your own queries. Uh, uh, so we basically make this data available as long as there's sufficient unique users to not uh, have any privacy issues. The, um, the data in the upper right would be useful for uh, perhaps as a signal to our ranking algorithms, right? If someone does a query in, uh, say, July for World Series, it might be more useful to show them college World Series pages than uh, sort of Major League Baseball October World Series pages. Um, so even though this is kind of an interesting toy, there's always lots of interesting data that you can imagine, including in uh, things like improving our search quality, improving ranking. Um, Summer Olympics is kind of interesting because this was a Winter Olympics year. Uh, <laughs> there was no Summer Olympics that year. Uh, this is just people pining for gymnastics instead of ice skating or something. Uh, and you also see interesting things that happen when a new word enters the lexicon. So Opteron is an AMD uh, processor that was introduced a few years ago. Uh, they first, you know, there was no queries for it before, and then they announced that they were going to be building this processor, and so people did a little few queries. Uh, nothing much happened until they actually released it, and then after they released it, it dropped back down to a much higher level than before. Um, and that's, you know, potentially interesting things. So uh, let me talk one, about one more kind of application that sits on top of this infrastructure, uh, which is machine translation. This is translation of human one human language to another, uh, Arabic to English, English to Arabic, Chinese to English, so on. Um, so the, there, most of the translation systems work as a set of rules that have been handcrafted by people over many, many years. And um, in the early 90s, there was a group at IBM Research that looked at what would happen if you trained a system by training it on lots of data where you had translated versions of one sentence and another sen the same sentence in the other language. And you basically just looked at probability distributions of if the word hello occurs, uh, I have a high probability of seeing bonjour in French, for example. Um, and basically, if you have enough training data, you can basically build a probabilistic model of words and phrases that tell you how to translate text without actually having any handcrafted rules. Um, so the more data you have, the better this will work. If you don't have much data at all, it doesn't work very well at all. Um, but the basic idea is to build a model that, given the source language sentence, tells you what is the probability of all possible target language sentences, and you pick the one with the highest probability. Uh, clearly, that's a very large search space, so you do a lot of pruning along the way to help guide the search. Um, and so for training, you basically have some amount of what we call parallel aligned corpora, where you can get, for example, uh, one, one big source of it is United Nations documents, which were translated into six languages, uh, literally sentence by sentence. Um, it tends to give your translation system a little bit of a United Nations bureaucrat kind of <laughs> <laughs> twinge to it. But so you want to use that data and all the other data you can get to kind of hope it uh, washes out. But um, the uh, basic idea is you find these parallel corpora and then you build these language models. One thing that really helps is in addition to these aligned corpora, which you can't generally get as much data of those as you would like, um, you can clean up a lot of the translations by having a very large language model of how often every five word sequence in the target language occurs, for example. So if you take all your English documents in the world, you're trying to translate Chinese to English, you have some amount of Chinese and English parallel data that you've trained your one of your translation models on. But another thing that helps is to have an enormous language model of uh, English word, uh, fr word and phrase frequencies. And you know, if you take 10 billion English documents, you process them, and then you have two candidate translations for a sentence, and one of them has a five word phrase that has occurred 43 times, and the other one has a phrase that has never occurred, you're probably more likely to prefer the one that's occurred 43 times. It kind of makes the translations flow a lot more naturally. Um, and then you actually just need to look up lots of probabilities. 
So, you know, I don't know much about machine translation, but I know how to look up data in a large distributed system. So I, <laughs> I worked with our machine translation folks too. They need to do about a million lookups per sentence in this uh, state, and the state is hundreds of uh, gigabytes. So it's kind of fun, good problem. Uh, and you see that if you have more data, uh, the, your uh, translation quality is better. This is a contest run by the National Institute of Standards. Um, it measures the percentage overlap for your translations with a set of four human translations of the same documents. Um, and at the high levels here, it's actually reasonably readable. You can definitely get the gist of exactly what the document's about. It's not perfect translation, but even if you took a human translator, another human translator and compared them, they would only get it like 80% because human translations are not 100% overlap either. Um, the important thing to notice is the more data you have, the better your system works. So you can train the system on less and less data to see what the effect of having more data is. And every doubling in the amount of training data you have basically gives you uh, a little bit higher score. And that trend seems to bear out as, long, as far as we can see. So that's kind of cool. Um, one of the things that I think having the right infrastructure helps with is that if your infrastructure solves a lot of annoying problems that are commonly repeated by seen and need to be solved by lots of independent groups, it allows those groups to be more productive in building sort of real products, which is what you really care about, and improving existing products. Um, so we tend to have people work in pretty small teams, work on, you know, some of the teams build interesting infrastructure, other ones build, you know, interesting products on top of that infrastructure. And we let people kind of play around with different things, like the thing that showed query frequencies over time is something someone played with uh, just as a side demo, but it's actually useful data in some cases for you know, improving search quality, all kinds of things. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting about, about Google is that we have a pretty broad range of problems. And the, the, the set of problems we work on spans very low level things like hardware and networking. How can we build large clusters of machines? How can we network them, connect them together with better bisection bandwidth? Uh, how can we design data centers to be more efficient for cooling? All the way up through, you know, how can you build you know, interesting distributed systems on top of this slightly unreliable hardware? Um, how can you build good data structures and algorithms for you know, a variety of problems? Uh, information retrieval and machine learning and statistics and so on. And then uh, all the way up to user interfaces and you know, product design. All those kinds of things are integrated. And a lot of the teams span lots of these different problems, which is kind of fun. Uh, so uh, we've written a few papers about some of these systems that I'll just point you at. Uh, if you want to, they go into a lot more detail about some of the inner workings, and I'll take questions. Yeah. Yeah, so one of the things we've moved to is rather than, so the question is, uh, does Bigtable give you any SLAs or, or latency uh, guarantees about different kinds of operations? Um, one of the things we've moved to is having uh, groups of operations, people manage uh, collections of Bigtable cells. So we have what we call service cells that rather than having each individual group run their own Bigtable cell. And as part of the service agreement, you can say, I have this much data I need. Um, you know, I need this kind of access to it. It needs to be, you know, three nines less than 10 milliseconds. And you can basically say, um, say that. Okay. Okay. I think we have, I don't have time for any more questions because I've babbled on too long. But I'll be around uh, at the breaks and stuff. So, okay. Thank you.